Welcome back to the Tim Blocks podcast, and hello again if you're watching on the Manhattan Institute's YouTube channel. I'm Brian Anderson, the editor of City Journal. I'm honored to be joined today by Johan Noberg. Johan joins us from Sweden. Uh, he's well known to an American audience as an author, a lecturer, a documentary filmmaker. He writes on a numerous range of uh, topics, globalization, popular science, uh, a lot more economic growth. He's a senior fellow at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C., and at the European Center for International Political Economy in Brussels. Uh, Johan is here today to discuss his terrific new book, Open, The Story of Human Progress, which is a finalist for this year's Manhattan Institute Hayek Book Prize. The Hayek Prize is an award that we give out every year to an author whose book reflects Friedrich Hayek's vision of economic and uh, individual liberty. I'm proud to be a member of the jury for the award, and I'll be interviewing all of the finalists this year on the podcast and for our YouTube channel. I know uh, Johan is uh, honored to have been nominated. He actually opens his book with a quote from Hayek, which I'll ask you about uh, later in the interview. So Johan, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Brian. I'm glad you liked the book. Uh, as revealed in the title of the book, you identify openness as the key fundamental ingredient that explains what you call the story of human progress. And in your view, this is more true than habits, culture, ideas, any of the other kind of explanations that are often put forward to describe progress in history. Can you uh, give the nickel version of your thesis of this book to start us off? Well, it is a very Hayekian perspective, uh, which goes something like this. There are specific cultures and attitudes and systems and institutions that are particularly useful, helpful to encourage innovation, growth, and decent societies, but we just don't know which ones. So we have to experiment and we have to learn. It's, civilization is a learning process. And openness is the basic institution that helps us to do it because it gives us uh, access to more eyeballs looking at the world's problems and more brains hard at work trying to come up with new solutions. And um, most will be bad, probably, or useless, but some will improve the world for all of us. So that's why we, if we want civilization and continuous progress, we need openness. Um, you speak, to get more focused on, on the thesis of the book, about the importance of being open to particular things, goods, uh, people, and ideas. Uh, I wonder if we could just walk through each of those, so starting with goods, you know, what is your view of the role that uh, trade has played in the development of, of humanity? Well, I it's not an exaggeration to say that um, it's not just mankind does trade, but trade created and developed uh, mankind. Uh, and because we can see some 300,000 years ago, Homo sapiens started to appear in Africa. And at the same time, we can see the first signs. Archaeologists find the first sign of, sign of long distance trade. So we find goods, tools made out of material uh, that came far, far away. And archaeologists say that this is probably a proof of long distance trade. And it tells you that being a trader, constantly exchanging favors, know-how, ideas, goods and services, that's part of human nature. That's a reason why we came this far, because trade functions like a machine into which we, you put anything you're able to create or anything you happen to have close by. And on the other side of the machine, you can take all the things that you need. So it creates this um, increase obviously then in, in goods and services that you need, but also an ongoing specialization whereby we become uh, experts in what we do locally. We can invest more time, energy, and capital in doing that. And in exchange, we get the best that others can create. Um, 
uh, second of those themes, people, the flow of people, um, you know, and, and how, how does that fit into uh, your hypothesis? Well, oftentimes, uh, new innovations are the result of uh, combinations of uh, different perspectives and different technologies that already existed. But you need that kind of serendipity whereby new things meet. Uh, it's, it's like hardware and software. It's um, uh, to create uh, steel, you need both iron ore and you need uh, the, the chemical, the technological process. You need um, combinations of the rail and and the train uh, to make that work. We need combinations, as Matt Ridley puts it. Uh, new ideas, that's the result of uh, uh, old ideas having sex and creating something new, a new mutation in a way. And people moving across borders, moving between different societies and cultures, they carry those ideas and that know-how, which is often not even verbalized. It's just something that you do. But when you end up in a new place, in another culture with other forms of know-how, something new happens. I don't think it's a coincidence that one of the first vaccines against COVID-19 came when you had uh, Turkish migrants ending up in Germany, meeting that university system and the state of biotechnological knowledge in Germany, combining that with the uh, technology and the capital of an American uh, pharmaceutical company like Pfizer, then suddenly you get something new, the first successful vaccine against COVID-19. So the people bring the ideas and uh, this proliferates across borders. So these three things work together, goods, uh, the exchange of goods, the, the flow of people, and the cross-fertilization of ideas. Um, That's right. One of the questions that you really tackle in this book is uh, the rise of the West and Western civilization as, uh, as the dominant kind of global force for at least three or four centuries now. That may be starting to change with the emergence of, of China and, and other uh, Asian societies as major economic players. But I wonder, you know, what explains the rise of the West? At one point you say it was just in a way partly out of luck, uh, but it was also, uh, I, I imagine, part of uh, part of the, story is the triumph of openness, right? Yes. and. I would say that uh, the the origin, and there are many factors here uh, involved, but the the real origin of um, the the lasting impact of the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, and liberal democracies in the Western world was the result that we were by accident more open than other continents, uh, because you had those attempts of more open ideas of. Uh, ideas about individual liberty and free markets on all continents, in different cultures. Uh, but they were defeated because there's often this tension within cultures between those who are open, those who are closed, those who want to innovate and disrupt, and those who want to uh, keep the status quo because often they're incumbents in politics, in the intellectual sphere, or in economics. Well, the difference is that those leaders, those uh, authoritative figures, they failed in Europe, in Western Europe, uh, because it was a more fragmented continent. So different experiments and innovations and eccentrics, they could often go elsewhere with their new strange idea about how the world works or how uh, to produce more uh, textiles in a more efficient way. Those ideas were often defeated. Monopolists, guilds, uh, religious elites, emperors, they were defeated in other continents, but with some 500 different political entities, uh, independent cities, independent universities, and different churches in Europe. They could often go somewhere else, and those who were in charge there realized that if they were a little bit more open to these strange new ideas, they suddenly became powerful. 
they got more wealth, they got a more thriving intellectual atmosphere, and therefore they could also defeat others in, in a, uh, more efficiently. So in a way, it was this fragmentation, this competition, partly because of geographical circumstances, I think, that explains much of what happened in the Western world. Well, moving forward to the uh, contemporary situation, you know, it's been uh, basically a year now uh, since uh, countries began closing their borders uh, in response to the COVID-19 outbreak. And we've read a lot in the subsequent months that this might be a turning point, a negative turning of point for the global economy, that we're now entering a new era of uh, much more restricted borders. Um, what's, you know, what's your view uh, about how the world has responded to the pandemic and how does that uh, have an impact on your hypothesis? Well, historically, we tend to open up and find new possibilities of mutual gain in cooperation and exchange with others when we feel safe. But when we don't, we retreat back to our tribe or to our nation because it feels like that's more, more safe. And those threats could be looking at it historically, economic depressions, natural disasters, military conflict, but often pandemics. Pandemics come, viruses, microbes come from elsewhere. So we tend to become a bit frightened and we become afraid of being dependent on international supply chains. So often instinctively we have this almost societal fight or flight instinct when there is a pandemic. And I think we've seen that now as well. We've retreated from globalization. Uh, it's like a, um, a terrible nightmarish combination of kind of uh, Steve Bannon-ish uh, nationalism and Greta Thunberg's environmentalists. No one is moving around, no flights take off. Uh, we've put global capitalism on hold, basically. So that was expected, but I think the result is already in that this has been a disaster. This was a global test of what would a non-open world look like. And we've seen that just in, it doesn't take many months before we have a global depression. Another 100 million people are thrown into extreme poverty because of this. So I also think that we have realized that the benefits, uh, all the things that we took for granted when it comes to just the, the making sure that uh, the globalization worked in hundreds of, of different companies on different continents, putting food and goods on our shelves. Uh, we take that for granted, but when it's not there, the result is a disaster. And we have also seen that it's not just viruses coming from other places. Also, vaccines do. We've never been seen this impre kind of impressive cooperation between hospitals, uh, pharmaceutical companies, and researchers in real time, uh, looking at the virus from different angles and constantly sharing knowledge about how to deal with it. And the result is that uh, a mind-boggling pace of technological advance. It took us 3,000 years to find a vaccine against uh, smallpox, but it took us three months to have four different vaccines in clinical trials. And within a year, we started to vaccinate people. Yes, it's, it's quite remarkable. Um, beyond the pandemic, uh, where do you see the major threats to uh, openness today? Um, in, you know, I, I certainly here in America, we're seeing uh, the emergence of what, what's been called woke culture. So a new kind of spirit of censorship and uh, uh, deplatforming people uh, who might be saying things that uh, offend certain other people. Um, what is, is that a major threat in, in your view to this, uh, this spirit of openness? And what other, you know, what other causes, uh, Nat, you mentioned uh, uh, nationalism, uh, you know, bu bureaucratic uh, growth. What, what do you see as the major threats to the free society, which is basically what you're defending? Unfortunately, there are lots of threats uh, right now, and that's the reason why I wrote this book. Uh, especially in times of trouble, of crisis, 
recessions, pandemics, um, and, and social media that uh, scares us every day, uh, we tend to become worried and we long for some kind of uh, structure, a strong man or big government to basically control the process and keep us safe. And uh, that's dangerous because what really keeps us safe is uh, uh, millions of people cooperating in civil society and, and on markets. I think that the new identity politics on the left and on the right, uh, I think there are two sides of the same coins, coin basically, they just pick different tribes. That is a threat. And if we learn anything from history is that we become successful and strong in our own group if we learn from the other groups. So in, in, this is what made the enlightenment uh, such a remarkable uh, revolution in human history because it was the result of opponents and people who don't didn't like one another who came from countries that were even at war with one another starting to listen to one another and learn from others because uh, not because they felt like this was a nice, uh, warm, fussy, uh, altruistic uh, uh, way of, of uh, moving through life, but because they learned that it was in their own self-interest. Other people who look at the world from another angle, they've seen something else than you have. And if you want to accumulate more knowledge, if you want to learn more, you should listen to them rather than cancel them. So this whole search for purity that we're seeing in many places, uh, keeping outsiders away and not being trying to cancel those who, who think it differently. That is a major threat to openness, I think. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the arguments that is now um, powerful on both the right and the left in the US is that uh, trade uh, is really responsible for the loss of manufacturing jobs in the United States, which has created a, a lot of problems in many communities. Um, so both, you know, both Republicans and Democrats these days have grown increasingly skeptical of free trade. We see this, you know, the Biden administration is not going to roll back uh, the tariffs that the Trump administration put in place. I wonder though, you know, what is your view of uh, the, the, the effects of free trade when it does have this kind of an impact on manufacturing, or perhaps you disagree with that hypothesis that there may be other reasons that manufacturing uh, has been uh, disrupted to some extent in the United States. Yes, I do disagree because it's not like we have a manufacturing crisis in the US. Uh, we increase manufacturing constantly, putting out more and uh, high value added uh, goods constantly, more than ever before. It's just that we don't need as many workers in the factories anymore to do it. So when you look at jobs lost, it's uh, trade can explain perhaps one out of 10 manufacturing jobs. The rest is all about uh, technology and automation. And uh, But I guess it's, it's more difficult to uh, pick on, on uh, the machines as, as the scapegoats. It's easier to talk about other countries and their exports but they are also losing manufacturing jobs because if they want to stay competitive they also have to automate and make sure that more of the jobs are in the most value added sectors when it comes to the design of the products when it comes to the marketing of the products when it comes to constantly tweaking the process to make it more more efficient uh, so so that's more important, uh, and a more important change. And the fact that consumers change behavior and they demand more service goods. So things are changing constantly. And what we have to do if we want a strong manufacturing sector and if we want new competitive businesses that expand and hire people is that we constantly have to move towards those jobs and make sure that we don't devote too much resources and capital to old businesses producing things in old ways, but but the new ones. And I think many of the worst examples that we have from um, the US and from Europe when it comes to de-industrialized areas, it's not that they were too open. It was more that they had a closed mindset. If you look at the 
American Rust Belt, so to speak, it lost more manufacturing jobs between 1950 and 1980 than after 1980 when they faced uh, foreign competition. And that was, when you look at it, it was because they were too self-confident. They didn't think anybody could threaten them. So there was no competitive pressure. They did not adapt to the new technologies. Instead, they tried to keep old ways of doing business. The only pressure came from trade unions trying to keep everything the way it was. So after a while, labor costs and the product, well, basically the, the cost of every product was 20% uh, higher than it could be produced in other parts of the United States. So they lost jobs to Southern states that were more open and flexible and had right to work uh, laws and other things. So. Uh, Whatever happens, you will lose old jobs and you can create new jobs. The only question is, are you going to lose those jobs in from a position of strength where you are also creating the new ones that expand and can hire? Or are you going to lose them like the Rust Belt did, losing it because they uh, failed to adapt? Well, in that case, it's not just the old jobs that disappear. It's, it's also much of the economy and of the culture surrounding them. Um, you you open your book uh, appropriately enough uh, for this context uh, with a quote from Hayek, as I mentioned earlier. Um, has Hayek been an influence on your work, uh, and what, in your view, is his relevance to the world today? Oh, certainly, it, it, he's a great uh, influence, and in many ways, I'm thinking of this book as an attempt to um, update his insights into the battles that we're facing today when it comes to the open society and free markets. And um, the quote that I'm thinking of there and what I use there is the insight of how many of our attempts, our, our discontent with living in an open world and an open society comes from instincts and attitudes that were developed in uh, another situation, in small-scale societies where we often only cooperated with in and within the tribe. And uh, as I try to update his insight, if you're thinking about the Homo sapiens over the last 300,000 years as just 24 hours, well, then these past 200 years were almost everything happened. Modern industrialized civilization, where we reduced extreme poverty from 90% to 9%, increased life expectancy from uh, 30 years to 72 years. That is just the last minute of those 24 hours. And that's an astonishing minute. It's the minute that we should be all grateful for, because that's the reason why we can lead the kind of lives in, 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 in this kind of way. So uh, more better health, wealth, opportunities than ever before. It comes from that one minute, but our instincts and our attitudes do not come from that minute. They were developed over the past 86,400 uh, seconds, not those past 60 seconds. So we have all those uh, fears of, uh, for example, um, trading, exchanging with, with strangers. We have developed many uh, instincts in a zero-sum game because when someone got rich in the previous 86,400 seconds, it was often because they stole it from you. They were raiders or, or free riders because few people lived to see economic growth, innovation over their own lifetime. So they had to be suspicious of other groups and of the, the rich, of the 1% and so on. And we still carry those fears and those attitudes and instincts today, which is a shame because now we've developed a situation where for the first time in free market societies with rule of law, you can only get rich by enriching others. So those same instincts that used to protect us against being exploited are now being used to attack those who are enriching society and ourselves every day. Your, um, your view, I wonder, uh, about China. How do you see uh, China emerging as a, as a global power? It's certainly um, in everybody's mind these days as, as a kind of rival to 
Western society, but yet at the same time, we have an enormous amount of exchange with, with China, including trade. I wonder how you see that, that potential conflict growing, how, how you see China evolving as a society. Will it become a more open society? That is yet to be seen, and this is something that uh, worries me a lot. What we have to keep in mind, and what I think that the, the Chinese Communist Party has to keep in mind, is that uh, China got rich and powerful now because it opened up. Because it opened up the economy and made it possible to experiment with foreign trade, with in foreign investments, with uh, entrepreneurship in the economy. If they don't understand that, and why would they? Because it, we in the West don't understand that. Uh, if they assume, which many people do in the West and in China, that this was somehow uh, a command and control model that created all this wealth, that is going to lead them into a, uh, a major difficulties in the future. Um, that's not the case. It happened because of grassroots changes, um, secret privatization of land to go from starvation to a food surplus, village enterprises that worked in the informal sector. The only thing that the Communist Party did in the 80s was to put their stamp on approval on this afterwards rather than sending those entrepreneurs to labor camps because they saw that it worked and then they imitated it on a large scale. That's the key to their success. And if they think that command and control is gonna be success, uh, the, the model for the future, which seems to be Xi Jinping's model, I think that they will fail uh, big time because after a while you exhaust your ability to imitate and to steal intellectual property from other places you have to develop innovation and um, from from strange new places within the economy and a dictatorship that uh, subtly explains to their successful entrepreneurs that now you have to apologize or abandon this ipo or this kind of technology they will never be open to the strange crazy ideas that people come up with in a garage Short term, I think they can continue to be successful because there is a lot, lots of entrepreneurship going on in the economy. And oftentimes, ironically, uh, they are more deregulated if the Politburo knows that people are doing something that they want to accomplish. They're more deregulated in those areas than we are in the US and in Europe. But when it comes to finding the new innovations, the strange new business models, they are just not open to it because that's uh, authoritarians are not open to to surprises and that will come back to haunt them in the long run and i'm not saying that that will they will understand that and that they will necessarily go and move towards a more open model uh, it could very well result in stagnation or even a major uh, crisis and a collapse but i don't think the one thing that history tells us is that in the long run, a closed authoritarian model based on command and control will not be a successful innovative economy in the long run. Um, a, a final question to wrap up, and this is a more personal question just about the reception to the book. I'm, I'm wondering uh, what it's been like and uh, what kind of questions have, have arisen that may have surprised you. Um, how, how's the book doing? It's doing very well, uh, thank you, and lots of translations are, are uh, coming online soon. Um, the weird thing is that it's the first time I publish a book in a pandemic, so my nice. uh, world book tour uh, has been done from my living room. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the fact that the World Wide Web exists and uh, all, all these fancy technologies from, from Silicon Valley, uh, obviously. It's also interesting, and this is one thing that people talk about when it comes to the book all the time. Um, it is about the pandemic. It's, uh, I didn't write it. Uh, I, I actually finished it before uh, we had um, uh, the new coronavirus uh, out there. But it, it fits uh, the model of open closed in so many ways. I write about historical pandemics and how they've affected how we deal with these things. And um, so that it's it's 
you know, sometimes when you write something, you wish that it will be seen as very um, um, uh, much in, in line with current events, and, and but but not when you write about the potential end of openness and, and of civilization. So this whole world of lockdowns and uh, basically shutting down global capitalism for, for six months has been horrible for the world, but actually it's been good for the book because now people are talking about open and closed all the time. Well, thanks very much, Johan. Uh, don't forget to check out Johan Norberg's latest book. It's called Open, the Story of Human Progress. It's uh, a finalist for this year's Hayek Book Prize, and you can find it on Amazon and uh, wherever books are sold. Uh, you can follow Johan on Twitter. His handle is at Johan K. Norberg. Uh, and to learn more about the Hayek Prize and see our other finalists, we'll have a link to it on the Manhattan Institute uh, website in the description for this episode. If you're listening on the podcast, we hope you leave us a review on iTunes. iTunes. And if you're watching this on uh, YouTube, we hope you subscribe to the channel and check out the other interviews which will be coming. Uh, so thanks again, Johan, for joining us. And uh, thanks all for for watching and listening. Thank you so much, Brian.